Welcome to another series of Heroes of the Faith and a very special guest today, a lady who I consider to be a hero of the faith. Her name is Jennifer Reese Larkham. Jen, it's lovely to have you Thank with you. us. I, I'm not quite sure what to call you because... No, just whenever, call me Jen. That's just right. Whenever Jen. I read <laughs> a, a, any books, it's been Jennifer Reese Larkham. Yes. You said call you Jen, but, mm -hmm. but then in the family, you were called Jen Jen. Yes, but I was only ever called Jennifer if I was in trouble. So that's why I wouldn't like you to call me Jennifer. <laughs> OK. Well, I hope I don't slip today and uh, it's Jen as we go along. And if uh, you haven't come across Jen before, then let me tell you that she is a writer and an author, she's a speaker, counsellor, and runs her own ministry, which is particularly helping those who've suffered, those who uh, feel abandoned, those who've had bereavement, called Beauty from Ashes. So we're looking forward to having uh, a good bro program and talking much together. Mm -hmm. And, and well, there's a quote in, in your book, Jen, where you say, um, life is quite hopeless. Why didn't I die? Mm. And I mention that because although we're going to be talking about grief and abandonment, it's, it's an experience that you've been through very much, isn't it? That's several times really in my life, yeah. Okay. Mm. Well, let's go back to, to the early beginnings. And uh, those who are like me a little bit getting on in years will remember your mum and dad. Just tell yes. us a little bit about mum and dad and childhood and what it was like. Well, both my parents were speakers and writers and they ran a conference centre in Kent called Hildenborough Hall. And that's where I grew up. So we had a community of 30 people all the time and then 200 guests every week. So it was quite a, a busy life, really. But very beautiful, too, because we had a, a, a lovely house in the country with 32 acres of garden. So there was plenty of places to hide, and it was good. <laughs> but, but your parents were, were enormously busy people. I, I remember mm -hmm. reading um, the biography, I think it was, or autobiography, mm -hmm. uh, and on a, one occasion they, they were getting into a lift and you know, they'd stand at the door of the lift and they'd plan, right, who's going to press the button, who's going to walk in, who's going to press the button <laughs> in the inside, because yes. every second was, was so precious to them, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, that's exactly how they were, and every meal would be a committee meeting, yeah. So, so did it mean <clears throat> that you as a, as a child growing up, did you get a lot of their attention? Did you see much time and spend much they time with them? They knew that it was a, a difficult to spend time because they didn't have very much but each of them carved out time each day my father half an hour every day after lunch when I was allowed to go and just be in his study and that was very special and my mother always used to eat meals in the nursery with us so we did see them but it wasn't quite a normal family by any means. Yeah. I'm glad you used that expression. <laughs> I wouldn't have said that. But, I mean, it was an extraordinary family. It was. You, your your mm. father knew virtually the whole of the yes. New Testament off by heart. Oh, he did? He did. And, and during, yes. going from, from home to, to work mm -hmm. or, or wherever, mm -hmm. he, he could recite the whole of he Romans. Did. He would go for a walk and, and walk until he'd gone right through Romans. Amazing. Yes. So what was it like from a, from a Christian point of view growing up? Did you find a pressure upon you? There were pressures, to be honest, there were. And I think that anybody growing up in a manse or a vicarage would feel the same because you're a bit in a goldfish bowl. It matters that you behave very well or you really feel you've let, it, let your parents down. But on the other hand, it has enormous privileges because of all the people who used to come to visit us. They're amazing people. <laughs> real heroes of the faith, <laughs> not like just ordinary me, but really wonderful people. And they would just come and just meeting people like Gladys Aylward and, oh, goodness, reams of other ones, wonderful mm. people. But did you mm. feel, therefore, you always had to be on show and always on mm. your best behaviour and you could never have dirty knees and, you yes. know, be untidy? Absolutely. But the garden was a place that my brother and I used to hide in, mm -hmm. get away from people because they always wanted to take pictures of photographs of us. And uh, so we hated cameras, so we would hide. <laughs> mm. I mean, it, people will find it remarkable you sitting here today, but, but actually as a child, you were very shy. Oh, I still am. I'm terrified sitting here, believe you me. Well, you haven't shown that today. <laughs> oh, you don't see my <laughs> knees shaking. <laughs> but but uh, in, in your, your school days, you, you had a, um, a teacher called Mrs. <laughs> Miss Mitchell. Yes. And it said... 
you were so afraid of her that you became a, a kind of gibbering idiot in, in yes. her presence because of your mm. shyness and, and yeah. reservedness. Well, it wasn't just the shyness. The problem for me was that I'm dyslexic. So I, I never learnt to read till I was 14. And writing, I had wonderful stories in my mind that I was wanted to pour out on paper. But of course, all the words came out backwards, the letters. I couldn't even spell was when I was a about 10 you know it was a major problem and in those days dyslexia wasn't known or diagnosed so you were called thick or lazy mm. and she call, called me that very often and it, is, it is a very a very degrading thing dyslexia because you are not a stupid You've got intelligence but you can't actually put it down on paper in the way that all the other children in the class can and I think teachers get very irritated, or they did in my day, mm. by that. Mm. I wish our founder was here today, Howard Condor, because Howard is dyslexic. Oh, really? And he I'd would like love to, 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 yes. to talk to you and, and yes. share the experience. And yes. it's, it's all the more remarkable because, I mean, you, you've got all these books that you've written. Yes. And so, so clearly something has happened which mm. has enabled you to be able to, to read and to write. Well, I would really love to say that God healed the dyslexia, but he didn't do that. But um, I think Bill Gates invented computers, didn't he? That puts a little line if you've got the word wrong. That helps nowadays. But I think the thing that really helped me the very most was the fact that I fell deeply in love with a school teacher. And actually, I was scared stiff of all teachers. But it was amazing that I did. Yeah. But this school teacher, I, I wrote a love letter to him after our first date. And I poured out my love for him in this letter. And he sent it back to me the next day with red mark, red lines and <laughs> corrections under it, but I still married him. Right. And he, he helped me, he, he helped me to write because I used to type things. It helps a lot to type if you're dyslexic. So I would type the stories out, children's stories, that that's what I wrote first. And he would correct them and then I'd have to type them again. And then he'd correct them again and I would type them again. This was before computers and then we'd send them off and get them published. But I could never have been a writer without that kind of help from him. Right. It was amazing. Jen, mm. after the war, 39-45 mm -hmm. war, yes. your father, Tom Rees, began to hold evangelistic crusades around the country and especially in the Royal Albert Hall. Exactly. Yes. They were very mm. successful. Yeah. So you and, and your family became household yeah. names that yes. the, particularly the Christian world yes. were they familiar with. Mm. How, what impact did that have upon you and your household and, and how did it affect you? Well, the thing was that my father never changed at all. Um, he, he was the same standing on the stage in front of 52,000 people in the Albert Hall as he was at breakfast time. He, he was um, completely unaffected by any of those things because I think he just realized it was God that was doing it and he could do nothing without God. And so he didn't have two selves at all. He was just the same. So I don't know that it really, at the time I don't think it made any difference. It just made us feel, I think, that we needed to support our parents and be extremely good, which has been quite a problem to me and to my brother as we grew up. Because you knew you can't actually always be very good, can you? <laughs> Not at all. But but you moved to Hildenborough Hall, which yes. which is a magnificent building, oh, it's isn't it? Wonderful building. And and Lovely. huge grounds, and, and mm. so you had the freedom of that. But also, you said all the time. Two hundred guests every week. Yeah, amazing, lot of people. Yeah. That's right. And and because mm. of the demands upon your mum and your dad, then you mm. had a nanny, yes. and you had a, a favourite nanny. Name of her Gom. name was Gom, and I loved her very much. Yes. But mm. they came when she had to go. Yes. A new nanny came, and new nanny came. you weren't very nice to a new nanny, were you? Why? hated her. Oh, she was a very nice person, but she wasn't my gom. She wasn't my mum either. It's a very difficult relationship, really. So I remember one night in the bath, I don't know why, I was in a bad mood, and I remember scratching her bare arms until they bled. And you know, if you, you've got wet, hot arms, blood's terrific. So I remember amazing amounts of blood coming out of her arms, and I was glad. <laughs> But then all of a sudden, my father's face came round the bathroom door and I was screaming with rage. He, he just said very quietly, Jennifer, in our family, we don't get angry. <laughs> then he went away. But 
because I really loved him and respected him enormously, that rebuke really was as devastating as any kind of a punishment, really. Mm. So I, I tried very hard never to be angry again. But of course, you always are angry. It's just how you deal with it. So I didn't scream and rage my anger out. I just pushed it down and buried it. Mm. And that's the most dangerous thing you can do. It was a bad life uh, lesson, that was, for me. Mm. I think we just need to, to unpack that a little bit because mm. w what you're saying is that that incident, which clearly has, mm. has remained with you throughout all the years, <laughs> vividly, yes. possibly resulted mm. in some of the effects. In, in one of your, your books, I can't, whoops, I've lost the quote in front of me right at the moment, um, but you talk about depression coming on yeah. uh, later in, mm. in your life. And uh, no, I haven't got it there in front of me, well, but never I had mind. Two major spells of depression um, after two awful things that have happened to me. Mm -hmm. And I think really that um, if you bury your anger down and you pretend it isn't there, and you put on this nice Christian smile on the outside, actually your anger has to go somewhere. Yes. And it, it turns to poison. I used to be a foster mother once, and we had one child that we fostered, and she was terrified of, of being sick. And so when all the other six children would have a bug and they would all be sick maybe 17 times in the day, she would never be sick. She somehow managed not to be. But the bug stayed there. And so they would all be back to school the next day, but she would be really ill because she couldn't get it out. And mm. I think that's what anger's like, really. Mm. It, it, it turns to sort of boiling bitterness inside if you can't express it properly and appropriately. It took me many years before I learned to do that. Yeah. There's a quote in, in your book which says, the realization that I suffered from depression on top of everything else was the utter humiliation. A few days after our weekend away, I wrote, September 1982, I feel buried deep in the ground under piles of heavy, damp sand, awful, suffocating darkness. Life is pointless, useless, and wearily boring the physical pains and other problems I could put up with, but mm. this depression is worse than anything else yeah. in the whole world. Yeah. And it is, absolutely, yeah. Mm. Th there may be some folks who, who are watching today, Jen, who can identify exactly mm. with what you've mm. wrote there in, in your book, because they may have other physical ailments mm. and feel, I can cope with that, yeah. but when the heaviness comes, yeah. when the depression mm. comes, that's when life does not seem like yeah. living. I think what, for what Christians, depression is the worst thing because one of the symptoms of depression is the feeling that God's abandoned you too. You feel so worthless that you feel God couldn't want to be involved with you at all. And I don't think other Christians are always very understanding about depression. They think it's some sort of awful spiritual sin that you've committed some root, something you're not managing well in your life and if you pulled yourself together you could get over it well actually if you could pull yourself together you jolly well would but the fact is you can't and that's why depression is so difficult mm. horrible thing okay mm. but for you if we go back to your story mm -hmm. life seemed to be taking a, a good path you met mm -hmm. tony you've mentioned this yes. Yes. teacher man yes. who you fell in love yes. with you you had some lovely children Yes, six lovely children. <laughs> <laughs> and then foster children on top. So life seemed blissful. It was. Mm. But then one day things began to go horribly wrong. Quite suddenly, really. I just thought I had flu. I felt achy and headachy. But when you have that many children, eight at the time, I think, you don't give in to <laughs> little, little tummy bugs or infections. So I just took a couple of disciplines and went on. And then after a while, I found I was seeing double and I couldn't make my arms and legs work properly. Finally, I was in an ambulance dashing off to hospital. I had, I had encephalitis, an inflammation of the actual brain. I, I nearly died. It was very serious. A lot of people do die of encephalitis. Mm -hmm. And I certainly had a near-death experience and I felt I was floating off the bed. My minister was praying for me at the time in the intensive care and um, uh, suddenly I, 
heard his voice going quietly in the distance and floated up. And I thought I was going to see God. I was always, I was so excited about that, mm -hmm. seeing God and what he would be like. But I, I never really quite got into heaven. I think it was his prayers, actually. <laughs> I have to forgive him for that. <laughs> but I felt suddenly that God was speaking to me and saying, do you want to come in or do you want to go back? I didn't want to go back because I could just see a glimpse into heaven of its being a beautiful place, mm. full of light and color and peace. But I also knew I had the six children and they were only little, youngest was four, oldest was 14 and I thought they need a mum. Mm. I better go back. Mm. So I made that decision but it wasn't an easy decision really because mm. life has not been easy since. Mm. Heaven is such a lovely place, I will never, ever be frightened of dying again. In fact, I really can't wait, because mm. I know it's going to be okay. Encephalitis mm. is a horrible disease to have. Mm. It, it affected you enormously, mm. didn't it? Yes, yes, it's caused um, damage to the central nervous system. And um, when I began to um, come around in the hospital, I found that I couldn't really move my arms and legs properly, couldn't speak properly couldn't really see, certainly couldn't balance when the physio stood me up, yeah. um, couldn't taste. Well, words were, were difficult to find. Rather like having a stroke, really, I suppose. Mm. Yeah. Very hard, because I knew I had six children and I <coughs> wanted to get back to them. And it took months before I was allowed to go back. And then I was like my own great-grandmother. You know, they had to look after me. Mm. wash my hair and push me around in the wheelchair. It's actually very humiliating. Difficult for them too, very. So you're in the Kent and Sussex Hospital, but you also spend also time in one of the in, central London yeah, hospitals. Absolutely, I How did. How long were you in hospital for? Well, with the rehabilitation at Burswood, which is a lovely place I was sent to. I don't know, perhaps for months, I suppose. Right. It's a bit of a blank because it's quite difficult to remember it now. <laughs> But the day came when you came home, and you must have been very excited, but it was home in a wheelchair, wasn't it? It was home, not, not quite in a wheelchair at that stage, but still very wobbly and needing assistance to walk around. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and so hmm. here, from being a mum who was the centre of everything, control, you know, dominating yeah. the home, doing yeah. all the jobs, looking after mm -hmm. the children, you were pretty disabled. And well, how, did, hmm. how did you cope? How did the children, how did your husband cope? It was horrible for them, to be honest, looking back. Um, because there's, when you're in a relationship, husband and wife, there's give and take. But when one is disabled suddenly, it's all give on one side and all take on the other. And you don't want that to be like that, but that's how it is. And I think a lot of marriages break up under the strain of that. My husband was exceptional and wonderful, and he was a wonderful carer for the whole of eight, the eight years that I was ill. Um, but it was hard for him, really hard. Yeah. And the children found it extremely difficult with all kinds of behavior problems from them, difficulties at school and, oh dear, everything in the book that you could think of. Yeah. It, it was hard. Jen, mm. we talked about the practical aspects mm. of, of your illness, um, but, but there's also a spiritual side to it. Yeah. But there's a, a, a quote that I, I can't imagine you saying, but it's, it's <laughs> in the book, so you must do. You say, one day on crutches that you lost your balance and mm. fell into some cow muck, <laughs> and you shouted at God, you've turned my life into nothing but shit. And the more that you struggled, you sank. Yes. Well, I just felt exactly like that, and I used even more bad words, which I will not repeat right now. But it, everything was going, this was two years after I'd become ill, and we were going to have to leave our house, because finances were really difficult. Mm -hmm. And we needed to be in the middle of the town, so the children could walk everywhere. So we were to move out of our home, leave the home, and I just shuffled my way out into the garden one last time. And at the bottom of the garden, there was a dip where the cows in the next door field would shelter and it was it was full of liquid <laughs> nasty stuff and I did topple into that and I, I felt that was exactly how my life had been because I'd waited two years for God to heal me and he hadn't mm. 
and I prayed. I'd been to healing services. I'd been all over. I'd done everything. I'd had demons cast out. I'd had counseling. I'd forgiven. I'd gone back through the past. I'd just done everything. And still, the healing hadn't come. Uh, I didn't even go to church anymore because they said I couldn't sit at the end of the pew in the aisle with my children because I was a fire hazard. So I thought, if that's what they think of me, I'm not going near. So I'd fallen out with all my Christian friends. And um, I think I'd badly fallen out with God, to be honest, because, you know, I'd, I'd chosen to live, but he hadn't helped me, so I felt. And uh, I was just in a bad way. So angry with them. We tend to think of prayer as, mm. as being something that we we have to compose the exact right mm. words and make them all very nice yes. and beautiful in and popular. In a special voice. Yeah. yeah you, your your words <laughs> were were not like that at all, and yet they were a prayer, weren't they? But that was the first time that had ever been real with God, because before I'd always prayed like that, because that's how my parents prayed. Mm. But that day I was real, and mm. all the anger that had been pent up inside here that I'd pushed down because I was a good Christian him out mm. and a lot of bad words and gracious me things I said to God you know you'd expect him to strike me with a bolt of lightning really mm. but that was the most beautiful moment of my life because he did answer me mm. and I suddenly felt absolutely surrounded by his love like tangible and I don't think that I'd ever actually believed or realized that he loved me. I'm sure he loved my parents because they were wonderful people and all the people that they looked after. God would love them, but that he could love an ordinary person like me, cursing and swearing in the, in the cow dung. It was phenomenal. They just loved me. And it, he just said, well, I didn't, he didn't speak in words, he just felt that he was saying, um, I'll be with you in this. I know how you feel. I know the pain you're in. But won't you let me come in the middle of it with you? And I hadn't been doing that, you see. I'd been saying, you've got to heal me. That's all I want out of you, God. Heal me. Um, and I pushed him out because he hadn't. I was so angry with him. And I needed to ask him to come back into that middle place in my life again. And so I sat there in the cow dung because nobody knew where I'd gone. And I couldn't get out myself. I didn't have the strength. So I had to stay there. And I just asked him to come back into that central place. And I, I know he did because it made a profound difference to me. Just massive difference. There's a sort of inner contentment and peace that comes when you've got him there in the middle. He didn't change the outside. We still moved house. We did go to the town and I didn't get better. I got worse. But actually, the difference was that he was there with me in the middle of it. That's the difference. And the children improved because I was peaceful. My husband was better and happier. And we did move to town. Mm -hmm. It was fun. And God didn't call you Jennifer and he didn't call you no. Jen. He would use no. your intimate name of Jen Jen. Jen Jen. That's what he calls me. Yep. Mm -hmm. Lovely. But he didn't bring the healing for you? No, six years more, waited. Yeah. Mm. Did, did, I mean, you talked about how people cast out demons out of you and prayed mm. over you. Did, yes. did people almost make you feel guilty because oh, yes. healing hadn't come and somehow it was oh, your yes. fault? Absolutely. I'm not sure whether it's like that these days, but in those days it was very much, healing was the, the major thing that everybody talked about, wrote books about and talked about in churches. And if you didn't get healed when people prayed for you, that they thought that it was perhaps some sin in your life or you hadn't got enough faith or you weren't trying hard enough or you really wanted to be ill perhaps because of some psychological reason. Mm. So it, it felt awful not to be healed, really. Mm -hmm. At this mm. point, your writing ministry hadn't begun. I mean, now we've got I some... I write children's books. You wrote children's oh, books, yes. all right. Lots okay. of children's books. But mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, you, I've got here today some, some great books. This is a, a year's journey with God yeah. that you've written, which is mm -hmm. each day a scripture reading and, and a thought. Yeah. And, and of course, there is also a journey into God's heart, which really is the story, the story that yeah. we've been basing mm. what happened today. Mm. But I, I believe somewhere around about this time, you wrote an article about your non-hearing. 
healing, yeah, I did. which appeared mm -hmm. in the Christian press. Yes. What kind of impact did that have? Well, I was absolutely amazed how many letters I got from people who, like myself, had tried hard to get healed and had almost been abandoned by their churches because they weren't healed. And they felt that God had abandoned them too because they weren't healed. And to hear it stated like that, and that <laughs> I must have talked about the time he came to me in the cow dung and showed me his love, that seemed to comfort people. And one of the people who wrote to me was the editor of Hodder and Stoughton, uh, a publisher, and said, would you like to write a book about that story? And I, I had written lots of children's books already, but I'd never dared to do an adult one, so I had a shot at it. And that's when the books came yeah. on, the, on the scene. And it was a bestseller, Beyond Healing, which astounded me, because I think it showed that there were lots of people who were disillusioned by not being healed. Yeah. Jen, to maybe, we're coming to the mm. end of our program. Mm. There may be some people who are feeling exactly like yeah. you were at that time. Yeah. Mm. They've been prayed for, demons have been cast out, and yet mm. the healing hasn't happened. What would mm. you say to them? I'd say God's bigger than that. And the one thing that I found in my illness was his friendship. And in the end, I got to the point of finding that his friendship was more important than outside health. Uh, and just to know him there with me was all important and always has been. Mm. Mm. And still is today. Certainly still is today. And there's a lot more in your story, which unfortunately mm. we don't have time for today. Mm. But next time we're going to be talking about some of the ups and the downs that took place in Jen's life as God led her on a journey that really was to take her to the very depths of despair, but also to the heights of joy. Jen, it's been lovely to talk to you today. Thank you so much for coming and being our guest. I've been speaking today to Jen Rees Larkham. In my sight, she really is a hero of the faith. Thank you so much for being with us. And until the next time that we meet, uh, God bless you in all that you do. Until then, bye-bye.